Facts First presents These 20 tragic facts surfaced after Prince's death, and they might bring a tear to your eye. Prince wasn't your everyday pop star. He was considered to be one of the greatest musicians of his time, perhaps all time. His songs like Purple Rain, When the Doves Cry, and Raspberry Beret made him an icon. Although he made himself a superstar, he craved a private life. When he passed away in 2016, the secrecy that he created for himself had many people wondering about his life and his death. These 20 tragic facts surfaced after Prince's death, and they might bring a tear to your eye. Before we get into our list, how about you help us out by clicking that like button? Also, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you don't miss our future videos. And also in the comments, tell us what your favorite song by Prince is ever. Prince loved to cook. His friend, Cat Glover, says that Prince wasn't an eater. He'd smell his food, but he rarely ate. He did love to cook, though. His background vocalist, Jill Jones, says he loved to cook scrambled eggs. He'd add a bit of curry powder and cheddar cheese, and they were great. Dancer Misty Copeland agrees, saying that breakfast was his favorite meal and he always knew the right combination of seasonings to add. Early in his career, Prince wrote some pretty provocative songs. In 2003, he changed. A lot. He joined the Jehovah's Witness faith, and he adhered to the church's principles. Swearing is not allowed, and Prince changed the way he wrote music because of that. He also had a swear jar, which he called the cuss jar. According to his friend James Lundstrom, he didn't want to dishonor his faith. He had a bucket in his home, and he would charge his guests between $3 and $10 per swear word. He traveled under a non-regal pseudonym. Prince's given name is Prince Rogers Nelson. He shortened it to just Prince when he started his career. Because he was very private, he would use pseudonyms when traveling. When he wrote songs, he'd use a pen name. The most common ones were Jamie Starr, Alexander Nevermind, and Joey Coco. When he traveled, he'd use the name Peter Bravestrong. During his last concert in Atlanta, Georgia, the luggage that he used had this name on the label. After his death, investigators found luggage with that name at his home in Chanhassen, Minnesota, and at Paisley Park, his recording studio. Prince made his on-screen debut in the film Purple Rain. In the movie, he played The Kid, which was based on him. The 1984 rock musical contained some truths about Prince, but there was one thing that wasn't real – his hair. He actually wore a wig to create the bouffant hairstyle. Steve Park, who worked as Prince's art director, briefly says that they were watching a clip of Purple Rain together and Prince told him to look at the wig. Later, he asked Prince's hairstylist Earl Jones if this was true. He confirmed that Prince did wear a wig for the reshoots, because by then he had cut and dyed his hair. Prince passed away April 21, 2016. Record Store Day took place five days before Prince died which gave music lovers a chance to visit independent sellers to buy albums. Prince bought six on that day. It's been reported that he got on his bike and he rode to Electric Fetus, which is a local music emporium. The six CDs he bought include one from Joni Mitchell, Stevie Wonder's Talking Book, Swan Silverstone's Inspirational Gospel Classics, The Chamber Brothers' The Time Has Come, Santana's Santana 4, and Missing Persons' The Best of Missing Person. After leaving the store, he waved to his fans and rode his bike home. Prince had a reputation for being a perfectionist. After he died, people who worked with him claimed that he could be ruthless at times. Michael B. Nelson played the trombone in Prince's backup band, New Power Generation. He said the Prince liked to push the band using fear. During a tour in 1993, Nelson missed a note. The next night, Prince walked toward him when it came time to play that note. He held his gun-shaped microphone to Nelson's head while he played the solo. He says that at that point, it was no longer showbiz. It was more of a threat to never mess up again. Van Jones, who works for CNN and was one of Prince's good friends, says that he left his mark on the world in more ways than one. Because of his faith, Prince wasn't able to speak about his humanitarian efforts, but he did help people every day of his life through charitable donations and good deeds. Van described a time when Prince called him after hearing that Lauren Hill had gotten into trouble. He asked Van to find out where Lauren's children were so that he could make sure that they were all right. He wanted to know if there was anything he could do to help Lauren and her children. Five months after Prince passed away, 
Charlene Friend, his ex-girlfriend, talked about his strange sleeping habits. She said Prince didn't sleep like a normal person. There were times where he would go five days at a time without food, water, or sleep. He'd just be going back and forth to the studio for days. When he finally did sleep, he'd turn the heat up to 80, cover the windows with aluminum foil, and shake all night. Later, she learned how her ex managed to go so long without sleep. His half-brother Dwayne Nelson told her that he used cocaine to stay awake. Charlene had trouble believing this because she never saw Prince take over-the-counter medications, let alone illegal drugs. As early as his Purple Rain tour in the mid-80s, Prince dealt with pain, specifically in his hips. He couldn't solve the problem with a hip replacement because Jehovah's Witnesses can't have blood transfusions, and that led him to rely on opioids to dull the aches and pains. When he died, the doctors confirmed that he had overdosed. He had taken fentanyl, which is a painkiller that's 50 times more potent than heroin. After his death, his close friends confirmed that he was addicted to pain medication. It's unknown if Prince's friends tried to get help for him for his addiction, but his staff did. They reached out to Dr. Howard Cornfield, a California-based expert in addiction to pain medication. It was five days before Prince died that this happened. Sadly, Dr. Cornfield couldn't fly to California to see Prince at Paisley Place. Instead, he sent his son, who was also studying to be a doctor. His son never got to speak to Prince about his addiction, though. The pre-med student was there when the body was found, and he's the one who made the call to 911. After his death, investigators couldn't find any prescriptions in Prince's name. They did find a prescription for oxycodone, which is an opioid, but the prescription was in his bodyguard, Kirk Johnson's name. Later, it was determined that Kirk got the pills for Prince. The investigators searched Prince's home and found painkillers, and some of them tested positive as fentanyl. The investigators still don't know where he obtained the fentanyl because the street dealers in his hometown rarely had the powerful drug. Prince refused to use a smartphone. Instead, he kept in touch with people through email and his landline phone. That meant Prince's laptop could have been holding some of the answers to the questions surrounding his death. During the first sweep of his home, they didn't search for the laptop. An officer from the Carver County Sheriff's Office told the press that they regretted not taking the laptop from his bedside because it could have contained conversations between the staff and Prince about his medications. When they went back to the home to retrieve it, it was behind a locked door, and many of the emails had already been deleted. You would think that one of Prince's greatest hits would have played at his funeral, like Purple Rain or Diamonds and Pearls. During his cremation ceremony, held April 23, 2016, a track was played for his close friends and family members, but it wasn't one of his big hits. In 1996, he wrote a song called Comeback during a trying time in his life. When he and his then-wife, Maida Garcia, welcomed their son, Amir, into the world, he had a fatal genetic condition. The baby died a week later, and Prince wrote a song through his grief. The song was on the B-side of his album, The Truth, but it wasn't very well known. It was the song that played at his funeral. Because Prince was worth millions, you'd think that he had an airtight will in place. Well, since his death, nobody has found his will. Because of this, the courts had to decide who would inherit his estate. They concluded that his younger sister, Tyka Nelson, would get a good portion of the estate, along with his five half-siblings. Because of ongoing legal battles, his estate is still in limbo after all this time. The year Prince died, he sold the most number of albums of any artist. After he died, he sold 2.2 million records. At the time, his music wasn't on streaming platforms, so fans had to buy physical copies of his albums. In 2016, downloadable versions of his music became available, and that made him the only artist that year to sell 1 million albums, both physical and digital. During that year, he also sold 5.4 million individual songs, which pushed him ahead of Drake and Adele in sales. In February 2017, his music appeared on streaming platforms and the catalog received 17 million plays in the first week. Before Prince died, he had plenty of projects in the works. After he died, these projects came to light. His friend, Maya Washington, revealed that he was talking to Netflix about a Paisley Park reality show. Hard to believe at first because Prince was such a private person, but a rep for Netflix did confirm that. After his death, there was also talk about a reality show starring his family. 
It was supposed to focus on how their lives changed after Prince died. There's no word about what happened to that project. Legal experts struggled to find an heir to Prince's fortune, and they also struggled to calculate his net worth. He had plenty of tangible assets, including his $25 million real estate portfolio. He owned Paisley Park and he also secretly bought the home featured in his video for Purple Rain. Prince also had intangible assets. For example, how much would his name, likeness, or music be worth? What would the unreleased Prince music tracks be worth? These questions put a huge question mark on his actual net worth. Prince once stored all of his most prized recordings in a vault. It held unreleased songs, rehearsal tapes, and concert clips. It was drilled open after he died. Since 2016, the new songs have been coming out from the archive. Over the next several years, we will hear more as his estate releases the songs. According to David Z, one of his engineers, he had an incredible work ethic. David says he would lay down two songs a day. Susan Rogers, another engineer, remembered the vault being stuffed with unreleased music since the 80s. Some of the music in the vault has already been released. In 2016, Moonbeam Levels was released on the Prince Forever album. Soon after, Prince's estate signed a deal with Universal Music to share more new tracks. According to a staff member at his home, Scott Laguerre, there is so much music in the vault, it may not be empty in our lifetime. The estate stopped Prince's former staff members from releasing the songs and nothing has been released since. Some details of Prince's life led people to believe that he lived a sad and lonely life. Turns out that Prince was living privately but happily at Paisley Park. In addition to his record store shopping spree, fans claimed that he was at the mall that weekend. Judith Hill, one of Prince's protégés, says he found joy in the little things. He loved the animated film Zootopia and he loved table tennis. He also loved to cook for his friends. Just because he was quiet, it doesn't mean that he was sad. Subscribe for more.